I'd like to thank everyone for joining in. My name is Robin, and on behalf of RARE and uh, Seattle Council of PTSA, thank you for joining us in this important conversation to share what's going on in our Seattle public schools at four of our schools in terms of racial equity. Uh, this is our first collaborative open discussion with uh, Seattle Council PTSA, and we are really thankful for all of their help and their very active participation. I would like to introduce June, who is not only the secretary of Seattle Council PTSA, but she is going to be tonight's technological guru. So, do you want to raise your hand? Yeah. Hi. My name is June No Ivers. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Secretary of the Seattle Council PTSA. If you have any technical support needs, please um, uh, don't hesitate to ping me in the chat. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to introduce Alan Bergano, who is a rare board member and also on the Open Discussions Committee. And he is going to share with you the rare land and labor acknowledgement statement. Oh, good evening. We would like to show our respect and acknowledge the Puget Sound Coast Salish peoples, past and present, on whose land we gather today. The Suquamish tribe and Muckleshoot Indian tribe are the federally recognized Indian tribes of Greater Seattle under the treaties of Point Elliott and Medicine Creek. In recognizing the history and respecting the sovereignty of Washington's Indian nations, RARE honors the heritage of indigenous communities and their significant role in shaping the course of this region. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little or no recognition. Similarly, we acknowledge the labor of other peoples who, while not enslaved, were exploited and whose labor also contributed to the building of America. Um, at this point, I have to acknowledge Robin for putting this whole thing together. She's like a one man show. show. So um, I'm excited to be part of this and to see a different perspective. As, as you, I mean, you may not be aware, but I'm class of 1971. I'm one of the very first uh, uh, busing class, voluntary busing classes to graduate from Roseville High School. And the tools that I, I took advantage of was uh, busing and uh, affirmative action. And those tools are gone. And so we have a new challenge now. And uh, I just I really appreciate everybody, you know, being patient. Like I said in my talk at Roosevelt, if this country was born in 19, 18, no, 1776, it took until 1920 to women for women to have the right to vote. So it's going to take some time to to uncover the and and you know conquer the divide. And uh, thank you for you for being part of the solution. And we look forward to working with you. And now I'm turning it back to our chief, Robin Lang. Thank you, Alan. Uh I am not a one woman show. It's a whole committee that did lots of work together. So Thank you, everybody. At this point, I would like to introduce you to Rina Mateja, who is our moderator. She is a dynamic woman. She was born and raised in Seattle. And from the age of seven, she was an award-winning philanthropist and a humanitarian. Currently, she's a student at Seattle, Century, Seattle Central, and she is a community advocate, an activist, and a nationally certified circle keeper. So she's done a lot in very little years. She is really active in advocating for student rights and for ethnic studies so that all students feel safe, loved, respected, and heard in learning spaces. She fights at the systemic level as well as advocating for policies and laws to reflect the needs and demands of communities that are silenced and overlooked. In addition to all of that, she also teaches what she preaches to other youth so that they can fiercely advocate for themselves and for others to create an anti-racist system. So I am very proud to introduce Rena Mateja, and she's going to uh, give us some rules of engagement. Rena? 
Hello, everybody. Um, good evening. Um, I would just like to say my apologies for my technical difficulties on my end um, for my camera. Um, but just some things that I would just like to make clear before we start is just for everybody to one, have an open mind and respect the voices that are being heard. Um, and also just if being mindful. So if we have any um, different experiences that we might hear or different viewpoints that we might hear, just being open to everybody. Um, and also just coming to the space to really just um, honor youth, most importantly, and just make sure that we're all doing the work that we can to make sure that youth feel safe and make sure that we're doing what we can to continue to um, grow what we are doing as a school system, but also as a community and as a nation. Um, so now um, we will have the panelists do a two minute intro and we can start in any order or if you would like me to call on you or if somebody would like to volunteer to go first. I see a hand raised. Yeah, that would be mouthy me. Uh, I just wanted to interrupt this by saying, if you have a question or a comment at any time, please use a lower, uh, please use the uh, raised hand emoji at the bottom of your screen, because that will put your face at the very top. And then Rena and the principals will know that you have a question. Otherwise, we, are, we have three screenfuls of, of faces and uh, using the raised hand emoji keeps us from having to scroll Three, three pages of people. So that would be very, very helpful. Okay, back to you, Rena. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before our panelists start, just real quick, if we haven't said already, um, any technology issues are to June. So like she said before, if you're experiencing any difficulties, reach out to her in the chat. Um, and just to clarify again, this is a recorded event. So um, if you are saying anything on here, it is recorded. Um, and anybody with a question or comment, I think sorry you just said, just use your raised hand. And Robin will also be the timekeeper. So panelists, um, if you go over a little bit or if we're running short on time, Robin will let us know that it's time to wrap it up or that we need to move on just a little bit faster. Um, and if there are any panelists who would like to volunteer to start. Yeah, I, I could go ahead and start. Um, and, and thank you for this opportunity, first and foremost. Uh, my name is Ivory Brooks. I'm the proud principal at Rainier Beach High School. And um, somebody please monitor time because I've been known to go over two minutes um, in introductions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'd say first and foremost, like I, I'm Seattle born and raised and more specifically, um, you know, I'm, I'm from um, this community that I am honored to be able to um, serve and support and lead. Um, and that, you know, and that means a lot to me. Um, and, and that's the reason why I'm so excited about this conversation um, this evening in regards to equity. Um, I'd say just another thing about me is uh just that i just have a, a a strong passion um for young people and i really and i really do believe that young people are the future not only of this community in south seattle but of seattle of the state of washington of the nation of the world and um and and so that's that's something else that i just you know would want to put out uh put out there uh, the other piece about me, I don't know if we're getting into personal things like, you know, I'm a big fan of pickleball, <laughs> right? Uh, former college tennis player. I attended um, Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi. So I'm a proud HBCU grad. Um, and uh, the other thing about just, you know, being from this community, like I, you know, studied at the Rainier Beach Library. Um, you know, I spent plenty of time at the Rainier Beach McDonald's. My parents still go to um, the Rainier Beach Safeway, but I'm also um, a product of Seattle Public Schools. Um, I attended Whitworth Elementary School, which at the time, it's now Orca K through eight, 
but it was an award-winning school, right? So um, it was a blue ribbon award-winning school. And I think something else about me is just that uh, belief in Seattle uh, public schools and our district and the fact that, you know, um, we definitely um, will be um, the model for the nation in terms of ec education. And I feel like um, we are um, really in a position um, to push to push the needle for uh, the equity work. So that's why I'm so excited about this conversation. And I'll end it there because I think I'm getting the hook of going over two minutes, but thank you. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody else want to go next? I will uh, go next. My name is uh, John Houston, the principal at uh, Whitman Middle School, and uh, this will be the 20th year uh, in education for me, the 19th year uh, being here in Seattle Public Schools, uh, and I'm very excited to start this year. Uh, we're seeing a lot of cool things happen. Um, I first started at uh, McClure Middle School and taught there uh, for a few years, and I uh, had the privilege of working with Sarah Pritchard. Now, Dr. Pritchett and uh, worked with uh, now uh, um, a fantastic crew there. Um, and then I went to Whitman Middle School and taught there for four years before I moved to uh, Ingram High School and became an assistant principal at Ingram High School and was there for nine years uh, before uh, having the opportunity to come back to Whitman as a principal of Whitman Middle School. I'm also the um, son of an immigrant. Uh, my mom was from Mexico, born and raised in Mexico, uh, and married a Scott-Irish guy from Missouri. So there's a, quite a mix uh, right there. Uh, but I'm also, uh, I think that gives um, kind of a different perspective um, for me and uh, something that I value and I think is important uh, in my work with our students here uh, in, in Seattle and uh, in particular with Whitman Middle School. So I'm excited to be here and uh, to share this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, we're happy to have you. Um, does anybody else wanna go next? Tammy, how about you? Hi, this is Tammy Brewer. Um, I'm principal Hi. here at Roosevelt High School, beginning my second year as principal here. Uh, this is my 30th year with Seattle Public Schools and uh, spent 28 years working at High School and uh, beginning my professional career uh, back in 1993 as a classroom teacher teaching high school and in those years we had full busing program and teníamos un programa básico feliz de aprender de mentores maravillosos que me enseñaron de la historia de donde había venido al distrito En ese momento teníamos 24 buses viniendo a la escuela de Ingram. Entonces, mi mentoría ha sido maravillosa en, en formar mi perspectiva. Y también las historias de mis estudiantes que he ido conociendo y sus padres, madres de familia y conocer sus historias personales. Y entonces, a partir de aprender mucho de ellos, así como yo también les estaba intentando de enseñar, Fue un proceso transformativo para mí, transformador. Y es una de las razones por las que he estado tan dedicada a Seattle, porque pienso que tengo esa deuda de agradecimiento de los students and families here. So I'm very um, excited to be here in a new school where um, there's a lot of opportunity to continue that on um, and move forward the work that the partners that I have the opportunity to work with um, are 
leading the way and I can be whatever part of that I will. Uh, so thank you for having me and uh, I'm ready to move forward with some work. Thank you. And then has, sorry, I'm just looking over all of the participants. Okay, I believe that is everybody. Um, if it's not, I'll give you a couple seconds. Uh, uh, Corey Wagner is ready to start. Oh, yes, uh, my apologies, go ahead. No, that's great, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, I appreciate being invited into this space with all of you. Um, my name is Corey Eichner, he, him pronouns, uh, principal at Lincoln High School in Wallingford. Seeing these fine panelists that I'm joining the screen with, I thought, uh, wow, I think I'll go last with my introductions because I would be the relative newcomer to Seattle Public Schools. Um, I'm native to Washington State and have lived in the city of Seattle um, for the past 22, 23 years, uh, but only recently joined Seattle Public Schools six years ago uh, with the reopening of Lincoln High School. I think for me and kind of my background, what drove me and what continues to drive me uh, in the work that we are doing in our public schools goes all the way back to my uh, um, initial teaching days. And I like to share, I have vivid memories of being a brand new teacher and my then assistant principal coming up to me and introducing me uh, to my paraeducator and said, you're a full inclusion social studies teacher. And I didn't know what full inclusion meant. I had to run to the computer. Google didn't exist, but at the time I looked up whatever the search engine went, was to understand what was being asked of me, which um, you know, put me on a, a path of really beginning to think about, you know, our education system and what we could do differently so that it served all types of learners. And so as a full inclusion teacher, then moving into being um, an ML teacher uh, within the social studies, multilingual learner teacher in the social studies department, um, working with a number of students in IEPs, seeing where the system was failing uh, wanting to expand my work. And that's what brought me into administration and a journey uh, that uh, sent me out to North Kitsap, where I was able to work with two sovereign nations in the North Kitsap School District, and then thinking about, you know, full-scale reform uh, down to the Federal Way School District, uh, as well as the Renton School District at Renton High School, um, you know, before um, I felt a big desire to come home um, and serve my own students uh, here in Seattle Public Schools. And I was, you know, blessed and fortunate enough that at the time um, of deciding to make the, the, the move back into Seattle Public Schools, it just so happened uh, that Lincoln High School was, you know, reopening. And not only did it give me an opportunity to work with an amazing team on rethinking public high school, uh, it actually is giving me an opportunity to serve my immediate community, um, actually where my house is. And so that's been a very special thing for me um, as I've come for, you know, come home uh, to do this work. And uh, similar to Ivory, my, my full focus has always been a very student-centered focus. Um, and the lens that I have brought, uh, particularly in my administrative career, I'm what, 16, 17 years in, 20 some odd, 22, 23 years total um, across the board, um, you know, really bringing this wide perspective um, from North Kitsap all the way to South King County uh, to our work that's happening here in North Seattle and, and arguably across the district. So I'm, I'm I'm humbled to be here. I'm humbled to be part of the Lincoln community and uh, super excited to uh, be part of this conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this discussion tonight. Um, and for anybody joining, um, our panelists again are Tammy Brewer, principal from Roosevelt High School, Ivory Books, principal from Rainier Beach High School, um, Corey Itcher, a principal from Lincoln High School, and John Hudson, a principal from Whitman Middle School. Um, and just to remind everybody, tonight's conversation is about um, just telling stories of the struggles and successes that we've had, um, not only with including students, but just making sure that students feel safe when 
they're in the building and learning, um, especially when topics of race and inclusion are being discussed. Um, so with that in mind, that's what tonight's questions are centered around. And so for the first question, this is for everybody and I definitely will give you guys think time. Um, and it's, do you think students feel safe and respected in your building as their whole self, mind, body, and spirit? And I will repeat that again. Do you think students feel safe and respected in your building as their whole self, mind, body, and spirit? Um, and I'll give you about just a minute to reflect on that. Um, and then after that minute, if somebody would just like to start or I can call on somebody. Okay, um, and if anybody would like to start. Um, Tammy, would you like to go first? Mm -hmm. one, one of the things I was the thinking about when you ask the question is, do I think that students, um, it's, a, it's a challenge to speak for or about what my students are thinking or feeling. I, I find that that's gonna take some context or um, just awareness that here I am as an adult person with positionality and, and so forth. So I really want to, to step back away and say um, the voices of my students would come and respond to this student this question probably in a whole host of ways. Um, I will tell you that I know students who come into my office in this last year and over my career, not just as a school leader, but as a teacher and come to me and sat with me and said, I'm not feeling safe. They've told me stories of not in their mind, bodies, and spirit throughout my career. Um, and this includes this fall, and I, we're, we're just in the third week of school. So I, I want to probably answer that question. <laughs> And I think that one of my fundamental jobs as an educator is to show up for them when they are not feeling safe. That will lead them towards safety, but recognizing that even in those moments, the students have left still not quite there. And that time and that distance to find safety is, is hugely diverse and, and complex. But um, my answer, I guess, simply is not always. Thank you. Um, Ivory, would you like to answer the question next? Yeah, thank you. I was just about to hop in. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with the principal Brewer. Is on here. He's a former teacher at Rainer. Led the charge um, in in terms of our restorative practices, 
And I think that's one thing, right, in terms of having kids feel safe, to be able to um, have opportunities for us as adults to listen to kids and what their needs are. Um, one of our mantras at Rainier Beach High School is we say at Rainier Beach High School is where everybody is a somebody. And we really try to embody that as much as we possibly can in terms of um, giving opportunities um, for all of our students um, to feel welcome and to feel accepted and to have opportunities for leadership roles. But the thing for me is um, just really being a learner because every single year there's a new cohort of students that come in and every single year we need to learn who those kids are not only by name, but by their interest and, uh, you know, how they can be supported. Um, and specifically, like, who is that? You know, obviously, we need to have at least one trusting adult um, or an ally that that student feels comfortable with that they can um, go to um, when they're not feeling um, safe in terms of mind, body, and spirit. But ultimately, the goal is for all of us as educators to be that person, right? To be those people um, that are going to be um, advocating and supporting young people. Um, and I'll say just one thing that's uh, been really um, a challenge just in terms of um, you know, the safety piece is just that, right? So there's a lot of things that happen outside of these school walls um, that raise anxiety um, for young people. And um, us just being in a position where we're able to help. Um, y nosotros estamos en una posición donde podemos apoyarles y darles apoyo con parte de los traumas que están viviendo fuera de la escuela, pero también que en el día a día ellos también puedan sentirse apoyados y confiados, que sientan que están emocionados por llegar a la escuela cada día, porque la gente que está ahí les escucha y les conoce, no solo por su nombre, pero saben realmente cuáles son mis planes, cuáles son mis metas, lo que quiero hacer en el futuro, porque verdaderamente me han escuchado. Entonces, la escucha considero que es muy importante. Estamos trabajando también el primer nivel de prácticas restaurativas en la escuela. For us to hear from our students in terms of what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Corey, would you like to go next? Yeah, certainly. Um, I would, um, definitely build off of, you know, both, um, you know, Principal Brooks and, you know, Principal Brewer. And I think what, you know, Principal Brewer, Brewer started with was immediately where my mind went was this is a hard question because this is actually a question for our students. Um, and, you know, hearing directly, you know, from them, I can point to survey data or, um, you know, different, you know, measurements that we've looked at, but that's not getting at the heart of, you know, talking to them, you know, directly. And I think this question, the, the answer is, the answer should be yes, that, you know, that our students, you know, um, you know, can be their whole self with their mind, you know, body and spirit. Um, but we're definitely not there yet. And I think part of the big challenge that we have is our system wasn't built for that. I mean, when you think of even the most basic structures of a six period day and required curriculum and exams and tests, the system itself with our school that our students come into, uh, you know, asks them to morph into the output that our K-12 system was, you know, built on. And so it's up to us as a community to challenge that status quo and to shake that up. And that, you know, is at the heart of what this question is. I mean, we have to move away from the, you know, you know, institutional barriers that are there that, you Las know, barreras institucionales que están ahí, que están creando. You know, that space. I mean, for us to, you know. <laughs> Our students and giving them the 
in an unknown person is Fahankas or an Elmihi and Anagi Utomeno, see a no Fahan, Ufahan Karno, the other in Karan Kusulis. Hado system Kahad that sent a bus of Shopin and when an unknown and some men with no Shopin, a coin and Ardevi, a little of the gold and Garab Kahel not more, a little of them poor. Uh, Smart, like Prince Ruru were saying, those you know times that we're talking with our students. Um, but our job in this system is to shake it, and and really challenge what we're being asked to do on a day to day basis. Because if we don't have this, I love this question, Rena. If we don't have this, that the rest of it doesn't matter. Um, and so we've got to keep shaking and challenging our system across the board uh, to allow the space and time for this and to really center our students above all. Thank you so much. And before we have our last panelist go, I just would like to remind all panelists that um, just to speak a little bit slower um, for our interpretation um, and for anybody watching, if what the panelists are saying kind of sparks a new question or, or idea, or if my question sparks another, um, like even sub question you have, um, also just put those in the chat so that we can see those as well. All right, thank you. So, um, uh, similar to what uh, Principal Eichner was saying, uh, you know, we do have climate data. You know, this, the, we we poll our students, we ask for information. Uh, I, you know, I, to we gather some pretty good information, and I think we have some positive trends uh, with that data that that's coming forward. Uh, but clearly, there's room to grow. Uh, with that as well. And I think of, you know, for example, we had the opportunity, I was about two years ago at, at Ingram, um, the question of uh, microaggressions in the classroom came up and uh, we had an opportunity to uh, pull together a group of students who uh, put together professional development for our staff. And, uh, and it was a lot of work that went into that as far as making sure that our staff was prepared for that and uh, making sure that our students were prepared for that as well. And having that opportunity to stand in front of their uh, teachers and actually present that professional development uh, was very transformative for many of our students. And uh, so the more we give opportunity for our students to have voice uh, in uh, and, you know, professional development and working with our uh, our staff, I think the more engaged our students will, will feel. And I believe that the more safe and respected they'll feel as well. Um, I think here right now, uh, we have really uh, latched on to the street data concept of listening, uncovering, reimagining, and then moving. And in order to do that, it requires us to slow down. And uh, for us, that means we have to take the time to listen, not only to our staff and our parents and our, our community, but we really need to take the time to listen to what our students are saying and pull that information in together and then come up with solutions. And an example of that is last year we spent, you know, basically the bulk of the year listening and uncovering before we even started the reimagining process with cell phones. And at the end of the day, we were able to come up with a digital um, uh, digital uh, citizenship uh, uh, agreement that was centered on what the students felt was important, what the parents felt was important, and what our teachers felt was important and we now are able to roll that out uh, knowing that we
we have buy-in from all three of those stakeholders in our community. So I think when we're able to um, incorporate these voices, then it allows our students to feel safe and respected. And I do believe, especially when it comes to their mind and body, that we're listening to them and, and hearing them out. We still have a lot of room to grow, and especially when it comes to our students of color furthest from educational justice, and particularly Black boys uh, and teens in our schools. Um, I think uh, we have a lot of room to grow in that. And I think if we follow some of these principles, uh, that might open the way uh, to improve that outcome for our students. Thank you all. Um, and this next question definitely goes into what a lot of you guys were talking about um, in your previous answers. And that is just, do students see themselves represented in required curriculum and or academic content in your school? And I'll repeat that one more time and give you some think time. Do students see themselves represented in required curriculum and or academic content in your school? And then panelists, you can have a couple more seconds if you need, um, but Corey, if you would like to start when you're ready. Sure. Um, I think, great question. Um, recently moved from um, an international IB school. Um, school or international. School local to international I think about our work at you know Lincoln as we you know open and began to think about um you know how we wanted to you know develop our um, you know, learning experiences in our classes. And this goes back to my first question that the system works against us. I mean, our national eh, state... Punto principal, que el sistema está trabajando. ...to um, having an you know, agency for our students and for our... and the flexibility on the part of some of our educators to expand beyond what is... You know, required and put in front of them, and so. Our ethnic studies courses, largely, you know, through our humanities and. Curriculum and purchase supplemental material from the start, so it provided us a chance to be. For 30 years, but the curricular examples is just part of it. It's pedagogical as well. I mean, we can have curriculum that students see themselves in, but if it's not being delivered or our grading practices aren't in a way um, that also allows for students to see themselves or have their own agency or have their own identity, the curriculum is only just part of that. And so I'm thinking about the actual curriculum and the materials we're using is the first step. But as we are shifting our focus now at Lincoln, we have to start also looking at pedagogy and how we shape our classroom and learning experiences so that also awards the opportunity for students to 
be their authentic self in that space and not just a traditional, you know, traditional manner. Thank you. And then if um, Tammy would like to go next. Um, I appreciate uh, what Dr. Eichner is saying when he left an Ivy school and came into a college board heavy school, the, the difference is tremendous. I mean, the, the, the woven curriculum that you are working for when you are in a school where many, many families are wanting their students to have advanced or learning opportunities, and they should. Um, I would say, <clears throat> you know, the, the, there's a distinction between types of curriculum and, and there's some that would be doing a, a much better job of this. Um, so I think that the, that leaves schools that are not an IB school without that foundation necessarily to step from. And so then the burden gets put into the instructional team's hands to really to, to take that next step and, and to make that come about, um, you know, I do think that there are many teachers who are doing that work. And I do think that we have some instruction happening where the required curriculum is there, but there's intent and purpose to provide a representation. And I think um, there are some teachers that really live out or teach as Dr. Goldie Muhammad expects us to provide windows and mirrors for our students, um, <clears throat> both in how, how they are as a human being, but particular lessons and pointing to it directly, overtly with students. Um, I've seen this in the sciences. Um, I've seen it in our history courses and in English. Um, I do think there's always room to press into this further, and um, I think that it would be wonderful to see us challenge the College Board in terms of their part to play with this in our high schools. Um, I think there's there could be something uh, um, to that. But beyond that, I would say I am proud of many teachers who are doing this work. Uh, despite having to, to really step across that divide that presents itself in a national curriculum such as College Board. So um, more work to be done, um, but we have some, some tremendous educators working hard to achieve that. Thank you. Um, and then, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, Ivory, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I feel like um, wow, these are these are great questions. <laughs> um, and one thing I'll, I'll start with that is just saying that we do have we have really uh, our teachers have taken a lot of time, particularly in our social studies and history department, um, to be able to really make sure that we're intentionally aligning with uh, the ethnic studies curriculum. Um, we also, and just kind of going back to just the restorative practices, right? And just having somebody in the building that students can can count on, right? Um, we give opportunities for students to be able to share and give surveys and things of that nature in terms of you know their experiences in their classrooms. But the reason why this question is is you know a challenging one for me as I'm thinking about it is um you know we're in the 9811 zip code right and so that's like the most diverse zip code west of the Mississippi right and so the thing about that is um you know there's always um new culture in having that diversity and then that tension of like thinking that culture is a monolith, which it isn't, right? So that this particular curriculum is going to, you know, just because it's 
this particular ethnic group, like this is going to be represented or the student's going to be like, hey, this is me. But that's not, you know, that that would be a misnomer. So because of that, um, just leaning into getting to know students is really what it's about um, in terms of supporting them with their learning. Um, the other thing about it, it for us is uh, like for I'll just give an example. And so um, we had uh, we have we had some students uh, from Guatemala that you know arrived at our school. And so one of our staff members was uh, he actually reached out uh, to the consulate, the consulate, um, and they basically uh, provided some curriculum, right, from Guatemala. Not not necessarily curriculum, but they some resources, like some books and some things of of that nature, um, for this uh, particular students, which which they, um, you know, we deemed would be helpful. Uh, but I think as as we continue to uh, move forward with our curriculum, I think it really is about hearing from families, hearing from students and surveying students to uh, see how they feel in terms of representation and some of the things that are in front of them. Um, going back to um, what uh, Principal uh, Eisner had shared out in terms of uh, just that IB piece, that really does give an opportunity, I'm right? It's um, good. Thinkers to be able to um, have an opportunity to kind of, you know, uh, share their expertise. And so they kind of become uh, the curriculum through the CAS pro uh, projects and things of that nature. But the thing about it, though, is that technically doesn't happen until the 11th and 12th grade year, <laughs> right? When, when IB kicks in, quote unquote. But what we do is really start to, you know, uh, have that uh, pre-IB piece in ninth and 10th grade. And I think that that's something that um, we can be, um, we can continue to to be better at. But that's a great question. And thank you. Thank you so much. And then uh, Mr. Hudson, would you like to go? Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I, I have the privilege of working in a middle school. So <laughs> the 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 uh, challenges that you know uh, my peers are facing in their high schools is significantly different than from what I experience in the middle school. And I would say that provides us a little more flexibility uh, than what you would see in the high school setting. And I think uh, Principal the one, one now looks to the setup. Uh, when she was mentioning, you know, the college board and uh, uh, how, uh, how much of a national, uh, you know, expectation do we have to abide by? And how does that impact how a curriculum is developed and, and used in our classrooms, even to the point of, you know, who are the publishers of this said curriculum? And, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Our Principal Brooks mentioned, you know, culture is not a monolith. So uh, we get the textbooks right for this, you know, two or three year period. In five years, it could be a completely different need. And so, uh, we really tie ourselves to things like that. Um, and then I really, I you know, taken away from what uh, Dr. Eichner was saying that um, it really has to go beyond books and curriculum. It has to. And uh, for us, fortunately, uh, that's something that we get to experience at the middle level um, and, you know, with middle level learners. And so we're, you know, we're uh, kind of... <laughs> delighted, you know, that we get that opportunity, um, but does it prepare our students for, you know, what's going to happen at high school? And so for us, we really, really want to focus on uh, developing those, you know, critical thinking skills, developing those uh, habits of learning, uh, and trying to make them lifelong learners by the time they leave Whitman, so that when they get to uh, whatever high school uh, they're going to, that they have some pretty good our students have some pretty good skills and practices available to them. 
uh, I think one of the things that's challenging for us um, is how do we move away from an individualistic approach to a more collective approach of learning and really uh, empower students to, to work in that collaborative uh, fashion so that um, one, they're prepared for you know reality of life once they, they get out of, of high school, uh, but also prepare them for the challenges of high school uh, when they get there. So um, I think there's a lot of work uh, that we can do in that regard, but I, I do, you know, as Principal Brewer said, I think we're really, really uh, in many, many ways tied to a national uh, expectation and, and uh, it really does uh, limit some of the things that we're able to do. Um, again, I'm in the middle school and I really feel privileged to be in the middle school because we get a little bit of that flexibility uh, you know, to do some of these things. And so we're excited about some of the work that we're doing where students are able to really um, demonstrate their culture and, and who they are as individuals um, and prepare them for uh, the next step when they go on. So. Um, thank you so much. Before I pass it back to June so she can do a check, um, just so you guys can get your brain thinking time. The next question will just kind of be a follow-up from the first two questions. Um, and it will just be mashing my question that I had with a question in the chat, um, which is how do you reach out to hear from those students and families who don't feel connected or safe in your school community? Um, slash, how do you help them feel heard and connected and then kind of the same question and question with the last question I asked. So any concerns you brought up with curriculum, how do you solve those as well? Um, and then I will pass it to June. Hi, I just wanted to make sure um, everything, just checking with the Spanish and Somali interpreters, are everything okay with you? And if there's anyone in the audience that needs um, that, needs the interpretation we're going to just check and check in with your needs um, if there is no one that's taking it taking part in the spanish or the somali interpretation uh, please let me know by 6 15 so that i can offer our interpreters their time back um, so please let me know my name is in the chat thank you Thank you. And then, um, Robin, did you have your hand raised? I just wanted to, to say that uh, you beat me to it. I was just going to say there are three questions in the in the chat, but you you're on it, Rena. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I try. <laughs> um, and then just going back to the last question I had just asked. So just to follow up on the last two, which is how can you make students feel safe and included um, if they aren't and also families. And then also with the curriculum from your last answer, any problems or issues that you have brought up, how can you solve those as well or help to solve those? My apologies. Um, and if we can have um, Principal Brewer or um, Principal Brooks go first. Ivory, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll start with the first question around um, how do we reach out uh, to hear from families? um to make sure that they feel heard and connected uh so one thing is is uh and we and we learned this actually during uh during covid right with the the whole virtual learning piece um we really were able to get a solid understanding of like we got to do anything by any means necessary, right? So, um, you know, families need support. So we, so from that, we really learned like, hey, we would, 
you know, show up at, at doorsteps, right. Um, with the team of interventionists or support to be able to really, you know, check in with families, um, delivering laptops and, you know, things of that nature, making sure that, you know, that families had, you know, internet connection and all of that. And, and with that, um, we, we are really working to be stronger in those practices even now, like paying attention to attendance, right, of students and um, reaching out to families, making home visits and things of that nature. Um, the other piece is just having a warm and welcoming environment, right? So, you know, there's no meeting more important than a parent showing up at the school. So just being able to to be like, hey, whatever I got going on, you know, let's hit pause to make sure that um, we can hear from families. Um, and then the other thing too, and, and we could always get better at this is like um, identifying, like when there are students in the building, I love that question, identifying students in the building uh, that maybe don't feel connected. What are those signs? Like, how are they showing us that they don't feel connected? Is that through you know, is that through behavior? Is that through, you know, like that student that's just kind of isolated over here and just making sure that we're, you know, that we're checking in with them. So I think it's an ongoing thing um, that we're really trying to perfect in terms of having, you know, all 800, <laughs> you know, students that we have in the building along with their families feel supported. Um, and it also, I just say it also, uh, takes the community for that to happen, right? So some of the resources that families need, we need to make sure that we have partnership and connection with community to be able to, you know, uh, make sure they get whatever they need. So us having an understanding of what, um, you know, our community providers can support with is also important. But if we don't, we're going to find out and it's, uh, you know, having an open door. Just the second part of that question is, um, well, I think I might have, I believe I, I may have answered both of those. But one other thing that I wanted to come back to um, just in terms of the curriculum, I think I, I had shared it out before, is just really being able to... Um, hear from our students in terms of what they uh, would like their learning to be, <laughs> right? So what can help out, what can help a student out in a particular class and trying to fill in um, any barriers that come up, whether they're around, you know, um, uh, materials or the learning needs to be more kinesthetic and hands-on, like just all of those things. Um, so that our, our young people can, um, you know, be academically engaged at a high level and there's not any, um, you know, barriers that we're creating um, for that. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful answers. Um, Principal Brewer, would you like to go next? Uh, I was trying to think about all the different layers to something of this nature and uh, being new in a community. I think a lot of my first year here has been assessing where we are and, and you know, not just from the big level data, but actually showing up and hearing parents speak into issues and um, being invited in to some circle groups that are being held in my counselors. Um, and, and students actually sharing from a firsthand perspective. So I think there's there's a lot of different layers to this. I have the long-term issues, the long-term plans I would have to reach an uh, a improvement in this area. I have my ongoing practices that I'm kind of expecting or calling educators towards. And then <clears throat> we also have our immediate actions when things come before us that are unexpected, right? So um, I think one of my big um, uh, kind of ongoing work has been pressing into the faculty here about every student having that safe adult. So do students report to us that they have that safe and supportive adult? And so that's going to be something that ongoing work will be done 
to find out from every student in the school, 1,500, right? Do you identify one safe adult? Who is that person? And uh, can you share so we know who to go to if something happens? Um, but long-term, I mean, we have uh, a lot of climate and community building work to be done here. Um, so there's gonna take some um, goals that we set in terms of engaging our families. I think there's some families that have been left out for certain. And so that's gonna be a plan that we are going to engage or go out and seek their um, support in helping us to make those corrections. Um, so that's an ongoing goal that we're going to have to set for a um, school-wide goal. And uh, I would say that um, immediate action is, uh, you know, being present with our families and responding to their messages. So, um, and that's a simple thing to say and a very hard and complex thing, thing to do on the daily. So, um I hope that I can listen to a few others here comment on their strategies as well. Thank you, definitely. Um, and if Principal Hudson would like to go next. Got it, thank you. Um, uh, I think for us, it's the question of being reactive versus proactive and uh, how do we, uh, you know, how do we get ahead of communication? How do we get ahead of uh, a known gap in our communication before it becomes a, 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 a problem? And then we have to react as opposed to being proactive in that process. And for us, uh, one of the tools that we've leveraged towards that is the use of our race and equity team, the RET, uh, which I think is an important component. Uh, we uh, intentionally leveraged the RET uh, to focus on our students and uh, pull these students together. Uh, last year that manifested in what we called our Brown, uh, Black Brown Ethnic Student Union and uh, allowed our RET to focus their time and their work uh, creating that, that, that quote unquote club. And in the process, um, we were able to uh, make some pretty significant connections with our families who, who historically are not represented uh, in uh, PTSAs or historically represented in uh, school boards and things like that. Uh, so for us, it was you know intentionally leveraging uh, the use of the RET, um, which is a somewhat funded position through the district, and I think it's significant. Uh, if we can, you know, keep that funding going, I think that would be important. Uh, secondly, we uh, also took advantage, and this is I need to give a shout out to Pat Sander, uh, who has worked diligently to connect and find resources for schools. And uh, through her leadership, they developed the uh, tier two care coordinator position. And I believe uh, high schools all have a tier two care coordinator. And uh, I was able to uh, test her at until we got one at the middle school. And so, uh, but, but we were able to secure uh, funding for a, a tier two coordinator which has been transformative, not only for our students, but for our families, uh, because we hired that tier two coordinator to represent the families that historically are not represented in our PTSAs and our school boards and, and things like that. And uh, so doing this, uh, we've connected with significantly with some of our families uh, and the outcomes of that is that we're seeing attendance improve. And if you see attendance improve, you're almost always going to see uh, grades improve with that. And so uh, we've, we've been really excited about that uh, opportunity. And I say that to say um, it's positions like this that don't typically uh, 
get funded. And, and if we're able to leverage these positions, then we can make some significant headway in reducing uh, some of this gap uh, of opportunity for our students. And then finally, um, I'm in a North End school. And, you know, typically, uh, you know, the demographics are a little different than a school south of the canal. And, and that's just a, you know, an outcome of racist practices. It's an outcome of, you know, a, a history of racist practices in our country and in our city and in our state. And so uh, how do we leverage, for example, resources from families in our community? Um, because uh, we're not going to get tier one money. We're not going to get uh, some of the, you know, levy grants and things like that. Uh, however, we do have a, a parent community that is is very interested in um, in breaking down some of these systemic uh, problems with with uh, bias and racism. And so, uh, por ejemplo, entonces estamos trabajando en eso con la organ con la asociación de padres de familia, quienes están dando fondos para equidad racial. Y entonces hemos tenido esta oportunidad Tuvimos, por ejemplo, el año pasado una comunidad de baile de Honduras que vino. El año pasado hizo una presentación maravillosa y eso unió a nuestros, a los estudiantes que estaban en nuestro equipo de equidad racial y a la comunidad. Y entonces es buscar cómo aprovechar oportunidades así. Entonces estamos buscando formas de ser proactivos y no reactivos. en cuanto a llenar esas brechas. Thank you. And then, um, Principal Incher, would you like to go? Yeah, of course, thank you. Um, I wanna, if I could first just touch on, I don't, uh, Rina, my, I don't totally remember the wording of the curriculum. Dice que no recuerda la pregunta acerca del currículum, pero cómo hacemos frente a los problemas de currículum que mencionamos en la primera pregunta. Y aquí es donde yo tengo que, eh, yo considero que tenemos que apoyarnos en nuestros expertos que son nuestros estudiantes y entonces acercarnos a ellos para hacer ese trabajo. Si tenemos un sistema de kinder a 12 y lo, todos los estudiantes se pueden ver como parte del trabajo que están haciendo en clase, tenemos que preguntar qué funciona y qué no funciona. Y decimos, esto se trata de contar historias. Y yo voy a la clase de estudios de personas de color en la primera semana y era un círculo maravilloso de aprendizaje. Y el profesor preguntó dos preguntas muy sencillas. Una, ¿qué ha funcionado para usted en el pasado en espacios de aprendizaje que quieren ver de nuevo? ¿Y a dónde ha habido barreras en espacios de aprendizaje que ustedes no quieren que se repitan en esta clase? Qué maravilloso. Nos beneficiamos de una escuela, de una clase pequeña en cómo, cómo salió eso, pero ese es el tipo de preguntas. Eh, vuelve a queremos arreglarlo. No sé por qué en nuestro sistema no hablamos suficiente con nuestros expertos, que son nuestros estudiantes. Ellos son los que deberían decir qué es lo que funciona y cuáles son nuestros siguientes pasos. Um, from this chat, I think from Natalia on how we reach out to students and families not, you know, feeling connected. Um, and if our system isn't something that people feel welcome to, that the last thing we want to do is continue just to try to, you know, force them into our system or bring them into our system. It's our job to go to them at that point in time, be it a student or a family member. And um, that's where you have to think about. And for me, I'm I'm going to pivot actually to structure. Um, Lincoln is 1,700 students and when I think about 
us going to our families or our students as a system isn't working for that becomes a little bit more daunting, you know, in a school our size. And so this is where I'm going to start looking at, you know, how we allocate our resources. And I'm going to just ask the question, do we have to take the money um, that are given to our schools and immediately divide it by 30 and say, that's how you allocate the funds out? I mean, that is what comes down from OSPI, like that's the system that's there. And I start, you know, you know, challenging, um, you know, you know, challenging, is that the way that we do it? And you know, so if we have to meet them where they are at, you know, we do our best work in tier one. And I want to comment the first step in tier one is our hiring practices. We've got to have the right people there, um, you know, in our, in our classroom, in our school spaces, but we're going to have folks who aren't there. And so, you know, we have to carve out of our available resources. And there was a question there on ESSER funds or think about how we use our resources so that we have the folks to do that work. At, you know, at Lincoln this past year, you know, we were thinking about it as a school and, you know, we, you know, carved out additional resources, um, you know, for having additional um, educator support for our multi-language linger, you know, multi our ML students, you know, support for them. We have carved out a tier two, not tier one, a tier two specialist at our school to do this work, to reach out to our families and our students and help build into the infrastructure of our school. Because again, we are very big at 1700. When tier one fails, we have to go to them at that point in time. We begun to rethink our school events, you know, you know, our curriculum night, our ninth grade orientation. How can we do that differently for those who don't traditionally show up? How do we go to them? Or how do we create smaller space? We brought in our affinity students and our student union groups for ninth grade orientation. We brought in our ML students and individual interpreter interpreters, you know, during our curriculum night last year, a plan that we're doing here specialist for our IEP students in smaller setting um, that works better both in and outside of the school uh, to create space for them um, that you know puts it in a more comfortable setting if what we are currently providing isn't right for them and we do that with our families and we you know endeavor to do that with our students as well and again I'm apologies for repeating myself and challenging our system. It's thinking different about how we're using our resources so that we have the folks to help support that. Thank you so much. And then really quick, could you just explain to maybe some of our families who don't know um, what tier one and two are? Certainly, I'll thank you so much. That was a great question. That is uh, education lingo, both on um, well, on many levels, but you can look at on academic, behavioral, social, emotional supports. It's almost like a pyramid triangle that um, you know the the bottom tier is you know about eighty five percent of your students. So what's happening in all of our classrooms, all of our learning spaces, all of our areas of our school that 85% of our students on that behavioral, social, emotional, academics, that they are being served and supported and their needs, their individual needs are being met in tier one. And then just like a pyramid, it goes up, you know, to tier two, where you have about 10% of your students, you know, for their individual needs to be met. Um, you allocate resources and supports and structures for tier two. And then you do the same for tier three, which is about, you know, 5%, you know, you know, two to 5% of your students at the top of the tier. It's education lingo, a way for us to think about how we structure our schools our systems, our supports, how we think about when we're doing our racial equity analysis tool with our budget, how we allocate the resources in the different in the different areas, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Principal Brooks talked about tier one at the very beginning, uh, you know, on a lot of effort and money and um, going into, you know, into the into the tiers. I would add to that also that um, there's a financial structure of tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four schools um, that um, I think someone put in the chat as well. Uh, and that I think there's a link uh, June put in there uh, that would be worth looking at. 
Yes, thank you. You actually beat me to it. Um, I had brought that up, one, because I did want clarification, but um, also for, I believe that was Manuela who said, uh, where's the question? With the, I think this might be different, but it was still a question from the chat. With the expiration of emergency funds during COVID, um, it seems as though allocation of resources for restorative justice practice or restorative practices tier one what would be a um what would be preventative measures measures has um nearly vanished while still using them for reactive um migration tape measures can any of you expand on that Yeah, I can. Um, uh, for Mr. Cadenas or, or for uh, Manuel over there, um, I just so just that just that tier one for re restorative justice practices. I'm just sharing in terms of the fact that everyone is a restorative practitioner, right? So every staff member is actually responsible for uh, being a restorative practitioner um, in terms of. Um, building those relationships um, in terms of how can we um, proactively um, just set that culture of connection um, within the school and how can we have um, student circle keepers right so students that keep circle how can we have students drive some of the questions how can we have you know in every single advisory um, you know, having the opportunity um, for circle. How can we um, think about, you know, very intentionally, um, you know, the language, uh, restorative language um, that we're using? How can we create spaces where, um, just like in circle, you know, there's the talking piece that goes around, but even when we're not in circle, hearing everyone's voices, right? And then kind of going back to those original points in, in regards to um, some of the folks that or some of the young people or families that feel disconnected, um, trying to dig deep, right? Because that's what RJ really does. So what is the reason why? Are we okay with facing the reason why, you know, folks don't feel connected? A young person doesn't feel connected. And I heard a couple of times just in regards to getting feedback. Um, and so, um, uh, sometimes what ends up happening is, and I'm, I'm just talking RJ just for a minute, um, because that's what the question was. Um, it would be like, hey, there needs to be this you know, restorative justice coordinator, and it's only the restorative justice coordinator really that could facilitate circle, um, or it's only restorative, uh, you know, this one person who is responsible for kind of res uh, res uh, spreading RJ practices. Um, no, we want we want everybody to be able to uh, to do that work um, because that that work of relationship and connection and having a you know a equal voice uh, in conversations is is important. Thank you. And then, would anybody else like to um, add on to that question before we move on to the next one? Okay, um, so with that, we can move on to the next one. This is like kind of a two-parter, um, but just for the first part, does your staff have the proper racial, cultural, and social emotional training to teach all students without inflicting trauma or false narratives? And I'll read that again. Does your staff have the proper racial, cultural, and social emotional training to teach all students without inflicting trauma and or false narratives? And I will definitely give you guys a second to think about that one. Raina, can you read it, the question one more time? Yes, of course. 
Um, does your staff have the proper racial, cultural, and social emotional training to teach all students without inflicting trauma and or false narratives? Um, and I'll just read it one more time before I call on everybody. Um, and this is for question four. Does your staff have the proper racial, cultural, and social emotional training to all students without inflicting trauma and or false narratives? Um, I'll give you guys about 10 to 15 more seconds to think about that. Um, and then I'll leave this one a popcorn. But if you guys don't answer, then I'm going to have to do a teacher and call on somebody. Um, and if Corey, if you would like to start when you get your thoughts um, collected, you guys can take maybe five more seconds if you need. But just to interject and be a buzzkill, we only have six minutes left. So if you could share all those minutes. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, Raina, thank you so much. A powerful question and a super important question. Um, I... Our community entrusts us with our with our students, and so I wished I could say yes. Like I really do. The answer should be yes, but the reality is, um, you know, no. I mean, we're that 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 is a big area, and it looks like Manuel, um, I mean, Emmanuel, you know, the staff that need it the most will resist it. I mean, we that this is an area that we have to lean into. These are the most important, you know, people, um, you know, students interact with our teachers, our staff you know, those in our buildings. And that is the job that we have to do. Um, I will share, you know, we began some of this work just at Lincoln, even just with that common vocabulary. And we needed to instill the importance of this through our, you know, through our racial equity team. And we began to shift our own lens from this idea of microaggressions. You know, we frequently look at stuff through the lens of microaggressions, which is kind of an academic term. And it keeps us in this safe spot of, oh, it was a microaggression. And we call it out as racial racial abuse. Let's say what it actually is as that starting point, you know, for that common vocabulary for all of our, you know, all of our staff um, and to not sit in an area of safety. Um, so no, um, but my hope, desire, and dream is the answer is yes. Thank you so much. Um, your on your honesty and transparency is definitely valued. Um, and if um, Principal Tammy would like to go next, I mean, I have a huge diverse group of faculty and staff members, and I would say um, each one of them is in a different place with different elements of this work. I mean, we have staff members who might be comfortable with social and emotional, but, you know, struggle to really understand the implications of some of the ways in which they're acting um, in, in terms of respecting cultural perspectives and so on. And vice versa. I mean, we, we find our, a mix. Um, and again, I've been with this staff for one year, stepping back, um, being new into a school, um, coming from another school in the district, what what I was interested to note is the, the great diverse uh, differences between different school communities and where they are in this practice and the growth. So um, I I would say, just like all learners, we have to take them where they are. I mean that that is where they are today. 
um, and getting to know what that is, is part of that, leading them into the learning. Um, but definitely it's, it's a, a huge different range of expertise, uh, willingness, interest, um, openness, and so on. So it's a pretty diverse range of, of, of faculty, and I would see different people at different spaces along that, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, and has Principal Ivory um, answered his question yet? Uh, not yet, but but I'll be quick. Uh, so yeah, just yeah, just the same. Like you know, the, the complexities and the fact that we're not there yet. Um, you know, I love what Principal Eichner said, just in terms of just calling it what it is, right? Not microaggressions; it's racial abuse. But I think the the really important thing is um to that willingness to learn first and foremost like how do we do this better the the willingness to be able to hear um when harm has been caused and be able to grow and change and 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 um make sure that that doesn't um continue because i mean this work is it's uh, this is urgent it's hyper urgent for our kids to be connected to their schools and to be educated at the highest level and be able to move on to you know um college career and beyond right at the highest level so i would just state the urgency and then um has principal hudson answered this question uh, uh, thank you. So I think that this kind of leans back into that other question regarding resources. And uh, I, I I know that there are at least two resources that are available to us in the building. And one is the, um, the restorative, the, the Circle Keepers, um, Weiburo, uh, and also uh, Racing to Equity are two groups that um, that are available to us. We have a contract with them. Uh, we were able to do some circles uh, with both of those groups, with different parts of our staff, uh, actually racing to equity, led uh, two full um, sessions with all of our staff in our uh, uh, racial healing circles. And so I think there's some opportunities for us uh, because the answer is, as everyone has stated, we're not there yet. Uh, clearly, we're not there that, yet. And so uh, it is it is the work that needs to be done. Thank you guys so much. Um, and now it is 630. So now it is time to close it. Um, I did have a couple more questions that I really wanted um, the panelists to answer. Um, so I'll just like read those out. We're not going to answer them today. Um, but definitely my goal was to give questions that not only you can answer now, but you can think about. Um, so these will just be more to think about. And um, the next two were just for more of the Northern principles. So it was how are schools addressing racism and white supremacy culture that is too often ignored or dismissed when experienced by students and staff of color? Um, and how are you beginning to talk about these issues to include youth of color without causing any greater harm or re-traumatization? Um, and just going into after school activities, what are after school enrichment activities implemented in your school to not only engage students, but to make them feel represented and heard in an inclusive manner? Um, and then the last one was just, does your school practice restorative justice in a formal embedded manner? Um, so those are just things to think about um, as we close out and as you guys continue your week with your students. Um, don't forget 
when you're talking to them in the hallway, just to ask them how their day is, to get to know them on a more personal level. Um, so that when you think of these questions, you think about better ways that you can not only serve your current students, but how you can serve the next generation of students coming up. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys so much. I really, 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 really appreciate all of our panelists for coming out tonight and for their amazing words and experiences. Um, once again, we have Tammy Brewer, principal at Roosevelt High School, Ivy Brooks, a principal at Rainier Beach High School, Corey Incher, a principal at Lincoln High School, and John Hudson, um, a principal at Whitman Middle School. Thank you all so much. And I will pass and, it and to Robin. And thank you, Rena, for doing such a great job. I just want to let everyone know that all the registrants will be emailed the recorded recording link. Uh, in addition, the uh, recording will be available on the RARE website in a couple of days, and I believe it will also be available through the Seattle Council PTSA. Thank you, June, for doing such a great job with all of the technology. And principals, you are wonderful. I wish I were in school. Mm, okay, that's a lie. I'm glad I'm not, but <laughs> thank you so much. Good night, everyone.